Good morning, good morning, Dumelang, Dimachironi, Tobela, San Bonani, Dumelang, Salam Alaikum, and welcome to the Women in Film and TV Production webinar. My name is Cindy Mabi. And the purpose of this webinar today, not only to celebrate the strides that women have made in this space, but also to encourage entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship in this space and uh, drive quality deals uh, and, and assist creatives to also comply and know where to go for funding. So we thought it or deemed it fit that uh, we close off Women's Month by hosting this webinar in partnership with the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. We also have uh, the National Empowerment Fund, the NEF, who will talk about the financial offerings and also deal with uh, any questions that you may have. From uh, the compliance perspective on Triple BE, Lindy Wema Donzella is a senior manager for compliance at the commission. And we have Mr. Mojalefa Koza, senior manager for education at the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission. So colleagues with that, welcome everybody. And thank you so much for making the time as uh, we, we, we know that this space has really put, put Brand SA on the map. When it comes to tourism, there are a number of uh, blockbusters that have been recorded and filmed in this country and have been exported internationally as well. So without any further ado, I'd like to call Mr. Mojalefa Koza, Senior Manager Education at the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission. Good morning to you and thank you so much for joining us. Mojalefa, it's over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Cindy. Thank you. Uh, good morning to the audience. My name is Mujale Fakoza, and I am a senior education specialist with CIPC, and I am responsible. I am responsible for all outreach programs on intellectual property. Uh, the topic for today that I'm going to cover, it's pretty simple. Uh, I am going to talk about the registration of films and why it is important for you to register your films. Uh, let me go straight to my presentation. Uh, these are the few topics that I'm going to cover. Um, one, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what copyright is so that you begin to understand uh, the relationship between copyright and, and, and the registration of, of films. Yeah, uh, these are the points that I'm going to touch on. One, uh, just to give you a historical background of what copyright is. And then I'm going to talk about how we actually take all these copyrighted works and put them into one product. And, uh, and I'm going to explain why our national copyright regime does not provide for the registration of copyright. And I'm going to jump straight into how you register films, how much it costs you to register films, and the common mistake that we usually find in the office as far as the registration of films is concerned. And finally, I'm going to tell you why it is important to get your film uh, or your uh, any other production, why is it important to get it registered? 
one, uh, copyright, unlike the other three types of intellectual property like patents and designs and trademark, copyright tends to be a little bit tricky. Tricky in a sense that it does not give you one right, but it, gave, it gives you a bundle of exclusive legal rights. And this is where it gets confusing because nine out of 10 times in one production, for example, in a film, you might find a number of copyright owners who own different types of rights in one product. That is why when the money starts rolling in, there is always misunderstanding as to who gets what and who owns what. So this is what copyright gives you. It gives you a bundle of exclusive legal rights over your copyrighted work. And in most cases, those rights are economical in nature. In other words, they are uh, there to make sure that you reap the rewards of your hard work. And uh, uh, they are also moral in nature, but that's not the subject of my discussion today. Uh, and this is how it all started with the Bene Convention of 1886 in Switzerland, uh, where copyrighted works were stolen. And a lot of creators started complaining about the stealing of their copyrighted works. As a result, countries of the world decided to come together in the city of Bene in 1886, where they all took a decision to make sure that all copyrighted works are protected over, all over the world uh, to member states who are, who are part of the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is WIPO. Now, because we are going to talk about feelings, I thought this slide would help me drive my point home because in a film production, for example, there might be a number of uh, copyrighted works, we call them quacks, uh, that, are, that are included in a film production. Now, owning a film does not mean that you own all these other types of uh, copyrighted works. For example, in a movie, if you can see in my slide, there might be a soundtrack and that soundtrack might be belonging to somebody. Now, what does it mean? It means that the person who has provided a soundtrack is the copyright owner of the, of the soundtrack, unless there is an agreement between the film producer to the contrary. Uh, and there might also be literary works in the film, for example, a script. A script might not necessarily be, belong to the owner of the film, but the script might be belonging to somebody who has written it. Now, in other words, it means the person who has written the script is the copyright owner of the script. So those are the things that you should be aware of. Then comes the production company. It might be your SABC, which will take the script, which will take the soundtrack, and will also take another, another work that we call performance. For example, in a movie, there are actors. Performance is also recognized, and performance is protected in terms of the Performance Protection Act. In other words, that performance in the movie does not necessarily nine out of 10 times uh, belong to the movie producer. So those are the things that you should be aware of, especially if you're operating within the film space, uh, that when you are an actor in a film, that performance is protected and it belongs to you and must be recognized and must be, must be, must be rewarded. Okay, now, this is what makes South Africa different from the rest of the world. For example, in America, copyrighted, all copyrighted works are registered. Uh, in Kenya, all copyrighted works are registered. But in South Africa, our Copyright Act makes no provision for the registration of all these copyrighted works except for films. In other words, when you paint a picture, when you write a book, whether it's a novel or it's a textbook, non-academic or academic, you get automatic protection for your work. When you take a photograph, when you put together a sculpture, that protection is automatic. You do not have to make an application to CIPC for protection. There is, however, one exception and it's feelings. The only type of copyrighted work that you can register with CIPC is a film. However, let me draw your attention to the fact that it is not mandatory for you to register a film. When you put together a film, just like all these other types of copyrighted works, you get automatic protection. However, when you register with CIPC to protect your film, you are actually giving your film added protection over and above 
the automatic protection granted to you by the, uh, by the, the Copyright Act. Now, a whole lot of people within the industry does not realize the importance of registering a film with CIPC because they think, if I am granted automatic protection for my film, why should I go to CIPC and waste time and money and register for protecting my film? Now, this is the reason. When you come and register a film with CIPC, we grant you what we call a registration certificate. Now, that registration certificate is going to help you in the future in case there is an infringement. If there is an infringement, you do not have, you do not have the problem of proving ownership in the court of law. You've got a registration certificate that's got a registration number four for your, your, your film. Therefore, the burden of proving ownership in a court of law, it's eliminated. That is why we encourage you that yes, you get automatic protection for your film. However, it is for your benefit for you to come and register a film, a film with us. Yes, we're looking into what the Americans are doing at CIPC and what the Kenyans are doing. We are working towards putting together a depository system in South Africa where you can deposit all types of, uh, all types of copyrighted works, whether it's a music, whether it's lyrics for a song, whether it's a photograph where you can actually deposit and get a registration certificate for depositing that. So that in future, when there is an infringement, then you've got a paper or a document that proves owner, that proves ownership. Registering a film with CIPs is quite an easy progress uh, pro, uh, process. Uh, you can do it manually or you can even do it online. And uh, when you do it online, the system will generate for you all uh, these four types of forms, the RF1, RF2, RF3, and RF9. RF9 is actually a declaration or a statement of case. Once those documents are in order, if you do it online or you do it physically, we will accept, we will put a, st a stamp and a date when the application was made. And the third step is we will advertise it in the patent journal for a month. And the reason why we advertise it in the patent journal for a month is to see if there are objections to your application. Uh, if a month go by and there are no objection, we take it. Uh, we are ready to do the processing. And uh, when we do the processing and everything is in order, we grant you protection in terms of the uh, uh, Films Act, and uh, we give you a registration, a registration certificate. That is how simple and easy the process is. And it does not cost you much to register a film, uh, unlike patents, which get uh, very expensive along the way, obviously, depending on the nature and the, and the complexity of the patent with films, we charge you only 590. The process is simple. You just go to CIPC website, you go, you go to online transacting, then you go to IP services, and then you'll get all these types of intellectual property uh, copyright and film registration included. And uh, you put together your application online. You put together your application online. Right. Now, these are the common mistakes that we, we, we come across as CIPC when an application is brought uh, to us. One, nine out of 10 times in an application, we don't get what we call a statement of case. And what is a statement of case? A statement of case is nothing else but a declaration from the applicant. Uh, for example, you have to provide us with every information necessary for us to process your, your application. Sometimes there is no statement of case. And in a statement of case, uh, you will find out who is the owner of the film. Uh, if there is more than one owner of the film, you have to indicate to us uh, that this film was jointly produced by yourself, the applicant, and the other party, so that we know from the onset. And the reason why we are saying this is because nine out of 10 times when there is a dispute, uh, one party finds it difficult 
to prove that he actually made a contribution towards the production of this reading. So we are saying it is necessary for you from the onset when you put up an application to indicate whether you are the single owner of the film or whether somebody has made a contribution as therefore a joint owner. Another thing that we realize, uh, we also find out that there is no date when the film was actually produced or the film was actually, uh, was actually finalized. That date is quite important to us and to you because it actually indicates when the production was completed. Number two, there is an RF9. Uh, and this RF9 usually has to accompany the statement of case. And the RF, uh, RF9, it's nothing else but an avidavit that has to be signed by the commissioner of oath. Now, in most cases, either we get an RF9 without a statement of case, or we get a statement of case without an RF9. And it is a requirement that you submit both all at, all at once, and it must be signed by the commissioner of oath. Sometimes we get an RF9, we get a statement of case, which is, is a declaration, but you find out that the RF9 is not signed and there is a problem and that is what, de uh, that is what delays the process uh, of, grant of us granting you a registration certificate. Yes, I've said again, making uh, the date of the making and the publication of the film, it's always important uh, because it's quite obvious that the date must always be in the past. But sometimes we get an application before us, the film has not been produced, the film has not been filmed, but somebody wants to protect it. The question is, how do you protect something that you, 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 you don't have? How do you protect something that you have not produced already? So if it's in the future, you cannot apply. It has to be passed, it has to be, it has to be, it has to be finalized. Now, <clears throat> to avoid cases of infringement, our advice to you as a registration of uh, uh, Office of Films is for you to come to CIPC and apply for the protection of your film. And there are a number of benefits that will help you in the future when you register, when you register a film. One, you will get a registration certificate. And that registration certificate, it's a proof of ownership. It will provide you, or it will serve as a prima facie evidence of ownership uh, if there is a court proceeding. It eliminates the burden of trying to prove ownership to the magistrate or to the court of law once somebody has infringed upon your feeling, okay? And uh, the registration of film also helps you to clarify the roles of directors, actors, and producers in the film. Because in the film of production, there is a bundle of rights as I have indicated in the beginning. And those bundle of rights might vary from one right to another. For example, in the film, when there is a soundtrack, there must be a declaration that this soundtrack belongs to a certain person and he owns the copyright to the, to the soundtrack. In a film, there is a performance. And performance in terms of our copyright regime, performance is a right worthy of protection. Uh, that performance by the performer belongs to the performer as and must be respected. It must be recognized and it must be, it must be rewarded. Because we have realized that in South Africa, especially as far as the television drama production or television production is concerned, nine out of 10 times, uh, the production company will own all the copyrights that are, that are included within the film production. And uh, it would leave a whole lot of people involved in the film quite disillusioned. And when they come to complain at CIPC, there is nothing that we, we cannot help them with. Because if you look at the contract that the SABC or ETV might have provided you, you will find that there are clauses that grants ownership of all the copyright works in the film production to the production company like SABC, for example. So you should be quite aware of those and make sure that you acquaint yourself with the contract given to you by any production company. If you're not clued up, get an expert to help you 
uh, so that you make sure that your performance is not given away to a production company, uh, so that you ensure that any copyright that you might be owning within a company, uh, a production of a film, is not mistakenly transferred to the production to the production company. That is why a statement of case is quite important to us because it affords you an opportunity to make any declaration that you have. And if there are any supporting documents that you want to attach to the declaration, they are quite welcome because they are going to make your life, a, 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 your life much more easy in the future. It further serves purely to and simply to enable subsistence of copyright in the film and the rights under the copyright in the film. Like I said, the bundle of rights that I was referring to might be in the ownership of one hands or might be in the ownership of various hands within a, a particular film production. Those are the things that you should quite be uh, aware of. Films that are unregistered enjoy the same copyright as those which are registered. However, when you register, you solidify your protection, you increase your protection. You have a registration case a certificate that will help you in the future to ensure that anybody who infringes on your copyright or your film is taken to task easily. When you have registered a film, just like any other copyrighted works, the protection will last you for 50 years after the death of the author. In other words, if I have to produce a, a, a film today, it is protected as from today, but the protection will also carry on from the first day when I am declared, I am declared deceased, after which it goes into the public domain. And when it goes into the public domain, the protection lapses. And when the protection lapses, uh, it goes into the public domain. Anybody can do anything with the film. For example, anybody can take the film and translate it into French or Italian if the Italian public or the French public are interested in reading the book, uh, 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 in watching the movie, for example. Now, for every copyrighted work, for example, in books as well, and uh, once the protection has lapsed after 50 years, anybody can take the book and translate it into a stage production. Anybody can take that book, translate it into French. Anybody can take that book and use it or change it uh, or alter it in any, 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 any other form. Uh, thank you very much. I think I have covered uh, what the organizers have asked me to do, and I made sure that I stuck to the uh, speaking points. Thank you. Let me stop here, program director. Thank you so much, Mujalifa, for that very uh, informative presentation. And I just want to pick on uh, the, the issue that you are saying it's not mandatory for film makers to register mm. their film. At the, and yet when you do register, you have uh, added benefits in protecting your intellectual property. What is the prevalence of copyright uh, infringements if you have that as a, as a maybe a percentage or ballpark figure and have you reached out enough or in other words, is there enough awareness around the issue of uh, copyright protection? Uh, thank you, Cindy, for a question. Yes, the issue of in, uh, infringement is quite prevalent in the country and we get quite a whole lot of, of complaints uh, from film producers out there, uh, from actors out there. But by the time they bring a complaint to our table, it's already late because uh, it doesn't matter what advice we give to them. Once an infringement has been made and uh, there is no registration process, for example, and there is a contract in place, sometimes between the actors and the production company, you find that you do not have a legal leg to stand on because in terms of the, pro, uh, the contract, you might have unaware, awarely, you might have ceded or you might have transferred any ownership of any copyrighted works in the film production. As far as awareness is concerned, yes, we're doing whatever possible as an office to make sure that people within the film industry are quite aware of the copyright issues as, as far as film is concerned. Uh, we have a number of outreach programs, for example, in Gauteng, we are in collaboration with the Houghton Films Commission, 
we together do a number of education and awareness uh, as far as feelings is concerned. We are also in the process of completing a memorandum of understanding with them, whereby we will move from Gauteng and move beyond Gauteng from province to province, educating all the role players or all the people who are involved in the film industry. So those are the efforts that we have made so far. And I think we're gaining, we're gaining ground. I know that there had been a, a very uh, concerted effort made collaboration with law enforcement to deal with the issue of pirating. And uh, we don't see those as much because it's now sort of migrated onto the digital space. So you don't see counterfeit DVDs being sold um, on, on the street corners. So let's now take it on to the cyberspace and how filmmakers can protect their intellectual property and the work that you do in, this, in that, in that uh, context. Yes, Cindy, thank you very much. We're quite aware that the consumption of copyrighted works have shifted. Uh, that is why in the streets you do not see counterfeited videos anymore because the way consumers consume copyrighted works has changed. Uh, the digital revolution has caught us unprepared as a country, and we're quite aware of that. That is why, if you are aware, we are trying to amend our Copyright Act because it's an old work that was uh, 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 enacted in 1978, and it did not take into account the digital space. Now, we're trying to amend it so that we try to regulate the consumption of copyrighted work on digital platforms like your YouTube, on digital platforms like, ye, like the, the internet. Uh, we are trying to tighten up all the loose screws so that we regulate the consumption of these products on the internet and we make sure that that space is highly regulated, that space uh, is beneficial to the creators of copyrighted, copyrighted works like music, like music and films, we're working on it. If you, you should be aware that the, uh, uh, the legislation that we're trying to amend it sitting in the president's office, uh, there are quite a few issues that we need to iron out, but all, as soon as the issues are ironed out, the president will be ready to sign, to sign those amendments and the digital space will be, will be regulated. And in terms of performers, um, you, you mentioned that we need to be careful in the type of contracts that we sign, but we know when it comes to content that is commissioned, that automatically then would belong to your broadcaster or network. Um, how do actors or performers then, do they have personal agency, the negotiating power to to want to protect their performance and be rewarded for it? Or is it a case of, uh, the, the winner takes it all. In this case, it would be the production house. Well, let me start with the legislation. The Performance Protection Act recognized performance as a, 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 as a work and as a right that needs to be protected. That's where it starts. But any, any intellectual property products, whether they are products that are patents or whether they are products that are copyright, are regarded are regarded as commercial products at the end of the day. However, for you to sell or to license your product, there is always at the center of, of it all, there is always the law of contract. And that's where CIPC lacks because when a performer goes into an agreement with a production company, CIPC, it's not part of that agreement. And nine out of 10 times, a performer would enter into an agreement without reading the fine prints of the contract. And you would find that at the end of it all, there is a provision or there is a clause within a contract that gives ownership of the performance to a production company. Now, that's the reason why we go all around the country to make performers aware that before you can enter into any sort of contract with any production company, read the fine prints, check the clause that gives away your performance to a production company. And if that is the case, say no and negotiate with the production company to ensure that your performance belongs to you 
and not the production company. You're muted, Cindy. Uh, please, yeah. hi. Uh, just before we let you go, can you also just attend to the uh, questions and answers? And if there's anything else that you can bring to our attention in terms of the development with legislation, the protection of performers uh, in the main, and uh, the remuneration that comes with it perpetually when, when the production itself has been reflighted or rebroadcasted. Is there anything else that uh, we may not have covered in that area? Yes, uh, let me talk about the performance that you find in the production of films, for example. Uh, one of the amendments that we have proposed in the Copyright Act, it's a question of royalties for performers. And I, I think that is a good thing for performers in South Africa. Uh, in music, there is what we call royalties. And uh, it's something that we do not ha ha yet have as far as actors in a film is concerned. Now, we are proposing in the new legislation that uh, actors in any production must be entitled not only to a once of fee, but must be entitled to your royalties. In other words, as the production moves and as the production uh, carry on to make money, they also are entitled to, to royalties. So that's a positive uh, for the uh, performers in South Africa. As soon as there is signed into legislation, the uh, performers within the production of films will be rewarded by, by way of, of royalties. So that's a positive that is in the legislation. That is an update for you, Cindy, and the audience. All right, much appreciated indeed, Mojalefa Koza, for that uh, informative presentation. And we'll, we'll, we'll share uh, with the, uh, our partners, everybody requesting that we please share the presentations as well. So if you can afford uh, us that, Mojalefa, would really appreciate it. Thank you indeed. Uh, and colleagues, we are simulcasting the broadcast on social media and everybody watching on Facebook and YouTube, you are most welcome to also engage as a creative or production company filmmakers. You may have even had uh, success uh, in your application process and you want to share your testimonial with us or your testimony, that would be very highly appreciated. Now, our next speaker is from the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition to talk about incentive offerings. And that is Ms. Nelly Molokwane. She is the Director for Film and TV Incent Incentive Unit at the DTIC. Nelly, it's over to you and welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Cindy, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Nelly Molokwani, uh, responsible for managing the film incentive at the Department of Trade and Industry. Um, my role is to ensure uh, compliance in terms of the guideline and also compliance in terms of the regulations uh, that are governing the incentives. Okay, um, the incentive started in 2004 uh, when it was launched. And in 2008, we make a uh, major amendments in terms of the incentives because, because, because the incentives were, uh, I think people could not access them well. Uh, so we ensure that we change the incentive and make it in terms of milestones. In 2012, uh, the incentive was extended in order to assist the post-production houses that are in South Africa to also or participate in the mainstream economy. And in 2014, because we saw that the film industry um, was not transformed and also most of the uh, black people were not participating, we launched the South African Emerging Black Film Incentives. 
Uh, and in 2017, the incentive was reviewed after we've conducted a study uh, in order to ensure that uh, oh, other hello. companies participate in the mainstream economy. And in 2018, the incentives was launched and became effective in 2018 September. Uh, taking um, now we look at the time is now to tell our South African stories. And mm. why I'm saying that we are looking also at the, at the heritage month. Mm. We need to tell stories about uh, the Rain Queen, uh, Mojaji, uh, stories about the Credo Mutua, uh, who had just passed on, and also stories about the uh, Koshi Sikukuni. Most of our young people don't know about uh, uh, our legends. So the DTI is pleased to announce that a call has been submitted uh, for documentaries or features. Um, the call is available on the DTIC website on www.thedtic.gov.za and the closing date is 30 June 2021. But application will be processed as they come in. We won't wait for the 30 of June for, for, for the closing will process application as they come in. And application are submitted online. Uh, the film incentive is categorized into four. We've got the foreign and television production, uh, post-production incentive. This one is used for foreign production, uh, looking for a location in South Africa. And we've got the best locations uh, that anyone can think about. And we've got the South African production incentives. These are our local incentives uh, where people can also do co-production between uh, white, uh, white companies and black companies. And we've got the South African co-production incentive. South Africa has signed uh, treaties uh, with uh, nine countries such as Canada, Germany, Netherlands, and Ireland. And we've got the South African Imaging Black Film uh, Makers Incentive. This incentive was introduced in order to nurture and capacitate emerging Black filmmakers to take up uh, uh, big productions. The targets, how can you tell the difference between uh, all these incentives? Um, for foreign, uh, it's 15 million uh, for productions. But if you're going to do a production, a foreign company partnering with a level one service company, it's 12 million. And for post-production to uh, take place, it's 1.5 million. For South African productions, if you want to do a production, the total budget must be 1.5 million or 500,000 for documentaries. In terms on, of the imaging, it's 500,000 for feature film and for documentaries. The reason why we have kept it at 500,000, we saw that uh, Black companies um, struggle in terms of getting funding uh, from uh, available funders or even from the banks because the banks are risk averse. And we know that a uh, film is a risky business to be in. So. South African uh, 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 principal photography for foreign, it's 50% must be shot in South Africa. For SA, it's 60% must be shot in South Africa. And for imaging, we want them to take the most uh, uh, shooting days in South Africa, it's 80%. And what are the shooting calendar days? It can be 21 days for a principal photography for, uh, for foreign. Uh, SA is 14 calendar days and imaging also 14 calendar days. What are the levels of the BE? The broad based black economic empowerment. Here we talk about compliance. Level three for the holding company in terms of the foreign and level four for the special purpose commercial vehicle. This one is a company that will be re fenced to do the production. And the holding company is the service company that has been dealing with production 
for quite some time. And the reason why we want a special purpose commercial vehicle, we want to ensure that there's no a, a cross a, or pollination of funds going from a SPCV to service company to other companies so that when you submit your final claim, the DTI is able to ensure that the costs have been made for the film that they have approved. In terms of the SA, it's level three for the holding company and level four for uh, the SPCV. For imaging, we've made it a little bit higher and say it's a level two for the holding company. Uh, budget, foreign production, normally when they come to South Africa, their funding is already secured. But we'd like to see 80% uh, full financial and they should close the financial within three months after approval. For SA, we are looking at 25%. So if you can look at that, the scale uh, is from uh, top downwards. For South African production is 25% full financial and the budget should be closed after three months uh, after application has been approved. For the imaging, we want only 10% of the budget must be fully secured and you close the balance after three months after approval. What is the maximum incentive? The ma maximum incentive that the DTI can give you is 50 million, but 50 million of the incentive depends on the total budget of your production. If your production is going to be 100 million, DTI is go, uh, for the imaging is going to give you uh, uh, 50 million. So the incentive is calculated based on the total production budget. Qualification in terms of the percentage. Uh, for foreign, we give you 25% of the qualifying South African production spend. If a production comes with a 100 million budget, but they're going to spend only 50 million in South Africa, we'll calculate it at 25%. But if you do more in South Africa, we'll give you more additional of 5%. But a, a, a production can come here and say, we are only looking at your uh, post-production facilities. We don't want to shoot here, but we, do, we want to do the uh, post-production. Then we'll look at their budget and we'll give them 20%. In terms of the South African production expenditure, we give them 35% for costs spent in South Africa. In terms of the imaging, we give you more, that is 50%. And we have added again that because they've got challenges in terms of equipment, they can apply for equipment, but the equipment must be in relation to the production that they're applying for. In terms of the equipment, we'll give you 2 million, which is uh, the company will pay uh, if they want pro uh, equipment for 1 million, um, then the DTI will give you a, a million. Disbursement, uh, disbursement it's, uh, for foreign, it's on completion of the production or post-production. But when you look at South African production, we can give you a payment through milestones. You can opt through milestones where a bonder should be in place. You sign an agreement with a, a bonder of your choice and you submit a, a milestones. The bonder will indicate to us that you've reached, you've reached a certain milestone, then DTI will uh, calculate, but the calculation will be based on your actual spend, not according to the percentage that they've sent. Because sometimes we have realized that uh, uh, it will be indicated that uh, we need to give you 20%, but you have only spent 10%. So we'll give you according to the spend, or you can submit a, at the completion of your post uh, of your production. But in terms of the film imaging, you can do milestones without a bonder, or you can do with a bonder. You've got a choice there. Um, if it is without a bonder, 
the company will send uh, a, an indication that we have reached a certain milestone. We'll request for the bank statement and the both bank statement must be verified digital bank statement. Not only bank statement just them by the bank because we have realized that companies are submitting costs that they've not spent and also uh, the bank statement maybe um, they are not authentic. So we are looking at very verif uh, verified digital bank statements. Um, comparing uh, uh, apples to apples, um, all productions uh, must be must register a special purpose uh, corporate uh, vehicle in South Africa at CIPC. Uh, in terms of ownership, because for foreign, it will be a service company uh, ownership, there's no uh, condition. But in terms of South African production, majority of shareholders, it must be at least uh, one South Africa playing an active role. role. And in terms of the imaging, 75% must be South African black uh, uh, shareholders uh, for the uh, for service company. And in terms of the SPCV, it must be 65% South African black shareholders. Uh, participation in terms of foreign, it's unlimited, but applications are uh, approved subject to availability of funds. Uh, in terms also on, on South African production, it's unlimited. But when you look at the imaging, we have limit people to five uh, uh, applications. And the reason for that, we want the imaging uh, 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 producers uh, uh, to graduate and start looking at the broader picture of even collaborating uh, with our counterparts uh, overseas or also in Africa. A commencement, all the films must uh, submit the application 45 calendar days prior to commencement of the principal photography. And the reason for that, we don't want to uh, participate where a production has already completed and companies uh, want DTI uh, to refund them. We want to be uh, to participate where we've uh, done our due diligence for an application and there's a, a contract in place. And credits, the DTI, we want uh, companies uh, to uh, credit the DTI in, uh, uh, in accordance. It can be at the end credit or it can be at the opening credits for the DTI. Uh, and we also require a DVD or a similar media so that we verify that this production really uh, uh, took place. Uh, qualifying formats, uh, it's, uh, we look at feature film, telemovies, miniseries, documentary, animation, and digital content. And we've, uh, we do exclusions in terms of schedule six or seven or 10. Uh, these are speculative or bundling projects or project commissioned by a local broadcaster or the SPCV is controlled by a local broadcaster. In terms of schedule six and seven, these are uh, uh, productions where they show a, a pornography. We don't uh, uh, participate in those. Uh, when they submit the application, a distribution agreement must be in place, especially um, after application has been approved and it must be submitted at a claim stage. Looking through the lens, qualifying South African production, at least 75% of the total budget must be defined as qualifying South African production expenditure, which means it should have been spent in our country. Majority of intellectual property must be owned by South African citizen. The director must be a South African citizen. Top writer and producer credits must include South African citizens. Majority of highest paid performers must be South African citizens. And majority of HOD and uh, key uh, personnel are South African citizens. 
qualifying uh, co-production in, uh, incentives. Uh, previously, the Minister of Art and uh, the Minister of Sports, Arts and Culture will give us um, will approve uh, the production that it uh, it qualifies as a co-production. Uh, currently, it's being uh, reverted to the National Film and Video Foundation, where they will do the due diligence and issue a certificate. At application stage, they will issue an advance ruling, but at claim stage, they will give you a final ruling, indicating that it does comply with the treaty. Uh, eligible formats have already indicated but there are those that we don't uh, uh, fund from the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. We don't do uh, reality TV uh, because um, they will get funding from anyone. They are easily to be uh, funded uh, because also companies will be looking at advertising themselves. Um, they would participate easily, unlike at a documentary or a feature. We don't do uh, news. Uh, discussion programs, um, advertising, current affairs. Uh, currently, we don't do video gaming, panel programs, variety, variety uh, uh, program, training program, pilots, soapies, or telenovela. Because in terms of soapies and telenovela, you are not sure when is that production going to end, because our funding needs uh, is supposed to go on for only 24 months, which is two years. What are the costs that qualify for foreign incentive? It's license fee, especially for post-production, editing suites, artist fees, sound studios, editorial and, post and sound post-production, post-production facilities, grading, outsource of animation, and uh, visual effects. All incentives, um, funding from government institutions and agencies cannot exceed 80%. If you submit an application to DTI, you receive a funding from a KZN Film Commission uh, and the National Film and Video Foundation and Houghton Film and uh, uh, Film Found, uh, Commission those expenses cannot exceed 80% because if they exceed 80%, it will be, it will be the production for government. It's, not, it's no longer your production. We want to see skin in the game. Claims are processed by a different unit. Currently, we've got the applications unit and the claims unit. And the reason why we have separated is to ensure that we minimize the risk involved. A cut off a date for application is always a first Friday of the month and the business unit has two to three weeks to finalize or complete a compliant application. Non-compliant applications will uh, return immediately and applications are encouraged to apply three months in advance so that if your application does not qualify, we've got an opportunity to return it to you so that you can correct uh, what needs to be uh, uh, corrected. Um, this is just um, showing you since uh, uh, 2016 until uh, March uh, 2021, uh, all the uh, production that we have supported, 297, with an incentive of 3 billion and projected a, a qualifying spend of a 12 billion. And the productions have um, supported full-time equivalent uh, jobs of 17,000. And the reason why we say it's full-time uh, job equivalent because the film industry do not um, employ uh, performers or cast an, uh, or crew for a longer period. Uh, films that have been supported uh, by women for women, uh, in terms of the imaging, it's 18 productions. 
uh, for SA is 10 productions and foreign are nine production. So in uh, participation of women, we have supported 37 productions. Uh, this is the process flow of our application. You submit form A application and you'll get an automatic um, a response of your application is acknowledged and uh, someone will contact you. So those applications are received by the, uh, the deputy directors will record all the applications and allocate, allocate to trade uh, industry advisors. From there, the uh, trade uh, industry advisors will pre-screen the application for completeness. And they will start a processing uh, application that are compliant and make recommendations. The deputy directors will look at those applications, uh, evaluate, check them against the guideline, and if they are compliant, uh, they will sign off. After signing off those applications, we prepare them for the uh, adjudication committee, which takes place, which normally takes place at the last uh, Thursday of each month. And if your application is being uh, approved, we wait for the normal due diligence of signing of minutes and the DTI will send you an outcome. If an application uh, has not been approved by the committee, uh, maybe it's being referred back for additional information, we'll contact you. Or it can be rejected from the, uh, uh, from the uh, committee. Government, we, we saw that we need to um, have synergy, not to work in silos, especially in the film industry. And we make a, a forum called South African Audiovisual Forum, which comprise of uh, the, the Department of Trade, uh, Industry and Competition, Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. As we know that the policy in terms of the uh, Creative, uh, creative uh, space comes from sports, arts, and culture. We have communication and digital technologies. Um, we know that SABC is part of them. Uh, we would like also uh, to encourage people uh, to ensure that the productions uh, are screened uh, at SABC for SABC to give us an, an, a, a, a mileage. Uh, for those production. And we've got the National Film and Video Foundation, which is an agency for Department of Sports, Arts and Culture. And also they are assisting in terms of uh, uh, funding production, uh, training, and also uh, taking uh, productions to markets. We've got National Empowerment Fund, which will also uh, give assistance uh, for applications We've got uh, Industrial De Development Corporation, um, NEF and IDC, they give uh, loans uh, for productions. And we've got uh, Westgrove, which is situated uh, in Cape Town. And we've got Gauteng Film uh, Commission, uh, KwaZulu-Natal Film Commission, uh, which also assist in terms of uh, development of productions uh, in KZN and GFC uh, development in Gauteng and also uh, ensure that uh, films that are shot in all these provinces are giving um, a market access. And we've got Eastern Cape, uh, uh, Eastern Cape Development Corporation, uh, which has also uh, been taking uh, some of most of the productions coming now from Eastern Cape. Um, and also they're assisting them in terms of market awareness. And we've got the South African Broadcasting Corporation. So we have ensured that we take all the national government to be in one space so that we can discuss it's either on the challenges or on the policies to better assist the uh, film industry. Organogram from our film applications unit uh, it's myself, uh, Dimakato and Elia are the deputy directors, and Mpo and Selina are the trade advisors who are processing the application. These are the contact details. 
and it's a wrap. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, thank you very much, Nelly. Uh, much appreciated. And uh, the in terms of the incentives, there's a question from Kim Crowey, who says 30 June 2021. Is that the correct date for submissions? As it has already passed, I'll just take three at a time. Another one is from uh, Mulatela Bosman, who says, "Thank you so much for the informative session. I would like to ask Nelly if." You can apply for two different projects at the same time. For instance, you apply for the SA Local Production Fund for one project and apply for another under the Emerging Black Filmmakers Fund, both under the same project. And the other one is, does the DTI application open throughout the year? Uh, and then we'll follow up with other questions. Over to you. Thank you, Cindy. I'll start with the last um, question. Uh, applications for the DTI are, are, are open for the whole year. Uh, we don't do open um, closed windows. And the second question, whether someone can apply for essay or for imaging. In terms of uh, application, we've got grading systems that we use. A person needs to grade uh, themselves, whether are they still imaging or they are, uh, uh, they are at the level of uh, essay production. So you cannot apply at the same time for different uh, incentives. So you need to uh, grade yourself. And in terms of the, uh, the call, the call is open until the 30th of June, 2022. Uh, apologies for that mistake. But we are processing applications uh, as they come in for the call. Thank you. Over to you, Cindy. Much appreciated. Uh, Nelly, just before you go, there, there is a, another question Uh, from Nemesis Productions, and they had made a submission. I just want to look at market failures and what the filmmakers are not getting correct. Is it the language, perhaps, in terms of the uptake of applications and the success rate thereof? I'm not sure you are, you are referring to uptake uh, from where, because uh, I think on my presentation was from 2016. So I didn't do the presentation terms from, from 2004. Yes, when but maybe you can just talk us through, sorry, okay. talk us through the market failures in terms of the language or why applications are being rejected. Is there something that filmmakers or, you know, the, the perpetual questions that come through or mistakes that are commonly made. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Cindy. Uh, market failures comes from, it's either uh, filmmakers do not know how to cost their budget. Um, another one can be maybe not understanding the applications um, or thinking that the application is the tedious process. Um, also not um, understanding uh, if maybe the applications have been approved because we give them three months to lock their yeah. budget. So most pro uh, uh, producers, uh, after, after being approved for, uh, for their productions, will just sit with the approval. And when three months come, it's an automatic cancellation. So we'll send it back and say, Unfortunately, you uh, you did not lock your budget, or you did not sub, or you did not sub, uh, uh, start your production within the allocated time, and cancel those productions. All right, there's one here from Raz Arnold, and they had made a submission to the NFBF and are waiting the DTIC to fund the post production. Uh, costs. And this one is a nemesis of a rapist. This is the production that they're working on. She says, often the uh, filmmakers or producers are required to 
um, solicit a letter of intent from a broadcaster. And for emerging filmmakers, this proves to be difficult if you don't have the requisite experience. And she wants to know that the they acknowledge the receipt of the application for one. They've done all the due diligence in terms of the requirements, made the submissions, and yet they, they still weren't funded by the DTIC. I know Nelly, you may not uh, necessarily be familiar with this particular production, but uh, wh why then would emerging filmmakers be required uh, if they don't have the experience to still get a letter of intent from a broadcaster? Okay. In terms of a, a, a letter of, of intent from a, a broadcaster, um, we, in terms of the imaging, we have made um, an added advantage that they still cannot go to the product, broadcaster, but they can register or go to any broadcaster that is available in South Africa or they can register for a distribution company with the film publication board. And if they've got that certificate, they can distribute their own production. So it's not, a, a, a we don't force, especially the imaging to go through the normal broadcaster. They can register a broadcasting, a, 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 a publication company with, the F, with FPB and they can distribute their own production. All right, thank you so much, Nelly, for your informative presentation. And uh, any other questions, please, in your time, if you would just address those as well. While we're still on the issues of compliance and the various policies that require uh, industries to operate, and not only in terms of tax compliance, but also uh, when it comes to the BE codes, we have Lindy Wema Donzela. She's the Senior Manager for Compliance at the BE Commission. Good uh, morning to you, Lindy, and thanks so much for joining us. Your time starts now. Hi, Lindy. Oh, good day, everyone. How are you? Uh, Very well, thank you. I'm good, thanks. My name is Lindo Madonzela. I'm from the Triple B Commission within the Compliance Division, uh, where we are responsible for advocacy, education, and awareness on the Triple B legislation. And we also assist the various stakeholders with uh, advisory services in ensuring that there is proper compliance with the Triple B legislation. So today, in terms of our presentation, we stem to uh, educate the stakeholders around who we are as the commission and what are some of the concerns that we have identified were some of the matters that either would have been referred by the incentive unit of the DTIC or it's matters that other, other stakeholders or members of the public would bring to the attention of the Triple B Commission. So as the Triple B Commission, we are a regulatory entity uh, we started our operations in June 2016. We came through the amendments to the Triple B legislation that were effected in 2013. So when you look at our mandate, uh, our mandate we look at overseeing, supervising, and promoting proper implementation and adherence to the Triple B legislation in the interest of the public. And that includes aspect around investigating fronting, or investigating initiatives that are not compliant with the Triple B legislation. And we also are mandated to receive Triple B compliance reports from both the public sector and the private sector. And through those reports, we are able to track and monitor the performance or the state of transformation. And we annually release what we call the national status and trends on Triple B analysis, just to give us a sense in terms of how we are doing as a country. So our jurisdiction is throughout South Africa. And then we also extend our mandate to those entities that are mandated in terms of the legislation to comply. And that will be uh, institutions that undertake business with government or it will be organs of state and public entities. Now, when we look at what is it that we do as the commission in terms of our services, what is of importance is to know that our services are provided at no fee at the present moment. So everyone is able to take an output uptake and all of our services. 
So we do lodgement of complaints uh, when a person is suspecting a violation of the triple B legislation or they are a victim of fronting, for example, they are welcome to lodge a complaint with the triple B commission. And we do also investigate violation, even in instances where there was no formal complaint that was lodged with us. And sometimes we do that in response either to tip offs that would have been brought to our attention or when we do our media monitoring, we may come across certain matters that may warrant us to probe further. And then also what we do in terms of assisting with proper putting together of B initiatives, we provide what we call advisor opinions. And this generally will be, or mainly what we have seen with the information that comes to us is with regard to ownership transactions, where either the, an entity intends to bring black people or black women on board uh, in terms of shareholding or the sale of assets. So what we do here is to advise the parties while they're still conceptualizing that transaction, whether how they've envisaged that transaction is consistent with what the legislation is provided for, and we advise them of concerns and then also assist them in terms of uh, remedying some of the documentation to make sure that the initiative is consistent with the B legislation. And again, on a day-to-day -day basis, we advise with regard to clarifications. The clarifications is aspect relating to interpretation of the various provisions of the legislation and that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And again, on compliance reports, uh, your JSE listed entities, your organs of state and public entities, as well as your sectoral education and training authorities, they are mandated on an annual basis to report to the Triple B Commission uh, by submitting their Triple B compliance reports. And those are the reports that once we receive, we analyze, and each entity will receive feedback based on their submission. And where concerns are noted, they will also be advised on that. And those are the same reports together with the information from our Triple B certificate portal that would analyze and issue the national status report. And then also we maintain a register of major Triple B transactions. So any ownership transaction with the value of 25 million and above, that transaction is supposed to be registered with the Triple B Commission within 15 days of that transaction being concluded. Now, our mandate is not to approve the transaction prior to it being concluded. So the parties will conclude the transaction and submit it to us for registration. However, registering the transaction post conclusion doesn't mean that we do not have to probe and assess that transaction to determine compliance. So once we've registered it, we issue the parties with a registration certificate, then we proceed to assess the transaction and we advise the parties of the concerns we would have picked up from the transaction and we even give them reasonable time to correct those concerns. There are parties who are able to correct and they will be issued with an, with an advice indicating that the transaction is aligned and then we are monitoring. There are companies that sometimes fail to address or correct the concerns raised within the stipulated time frame, then they will be advised to go and under, undergo a re-verification and exclude that black ownership that they are recognizing simply because it is contrary to the triple B legislation for one to recognize a structure that is not consistent. Then when they go for re-verification, they will submit a certificate that excludes that ownership. Then you have entities that do not align and do not get re-verified. And those will be entities that will refer for investigation. Within the commission, we've got a division called investigation enforcement. When we refer it there is for them to probe proper and further violation of the triple B legislation. And also as part of educating stakeholders, we issue explanatory notices and practice guides on specific aspect in the legislation that we will see that a lot of queries or engagement have been centered around that particular area. And maybe it's important that we have a broader uh, guide that will give that interpretation. And we do also issue advisory or instruction letters. Advisory letters could be on a structure that has been presented to us, maybe on a matter that is referred from the DTIC incentive on what they would have picked up. So when we assess it in terms of the legislation, then we we'll issue them with an advisory letter indicating what the status is. We do also embark on education and awareness sessions as well as conduct site visits based on tip-offs that we still think that we need to collect further information before we can attend to that issue. Now, when we look at the how, what is the relationship between the film and incentive, the film incentives that have been earlier presented on, 
is because when you go specifically to the B legislation, it mandates organs of state and public entities to apply the relevant codes of good practice when they undertake several economic activities. And amongst those economic activities is when they are determining a criteria for awarding of incentive grants or investment schemes and support of triple BE. So you note that from the presentation from Nelly, she indicated that there are triple B requirements that have been set, which looks at a triple B level that an entity that is applying for the film incentive needs to possess. And that is because they are responding to this obligation from a triple BE legislation. Now, what was of importance is to understand that as then they look at, or you are required as a one who's going to make an application uh, for and to access the film incentive, uh, you need to then determine your BE compliance in line with the codes of good practice. Currently, we've got 11 codes of good practice. And then how we categorize them is that we say we've got the general codes, which applies across the board. And we also have sector codes. These are sector codes that were, came into being uh, based on the need from the different stakeholders within that sector advocating for a sector code in order to address the peculiarities that are focused within that sector and to advance transformation. So when we talk about the film uh, sector or film industry, they would then apply what we refer to as the general codes of good practice because they do not have a sector code that will then look at the specific issues and isolate those issues only with regard to the film sector. So when we assess from the B Commission side an aspect or compliance of an ownership structure, as an example, in relation to the incentive or a film incentive that they've uh, tried to access, uh, to access, we'll look at that in line with the general codes. And in the next slide, we'll then unpack how we do that. Now, what we do in terms of triple B legislation, the triple B legislation categorizes entities in terms of what we call their total annual revenue. And depending on which category you fall, there are specific triple B obligations that we then need to respond to. So we've got three types of entities. We have your exempted micro enterprises, followed by your qualifying small enterprises, as well as your large enterprises. So if you are within the exempted micro enterprise category, it means that you are generating an annual total revenue of between of zero and less than 10 million. So based on the size of entity that you are, uh, you are then exempted from being subjected to a triple B verification process. And the legislation awards automatic levels to these type of entities. So these entities automatically receive a, a level four triple B status. And when they receive a level four triple B status, for them to prove their B compliance, they either use a son of a David or a certificate issued by the Companies and Intellectual Property Commission. The certificate from CIPC is only issued to startup enterprises and those entities whose total annual revenue is uh, less than 10 million. However, in, in terms of enhancing those entities that are black owned, entities that are at least 51% black owned, they will receive automatic level two. And those that are 100% black owned, they will receive an automatic level one. So when you go to the template that the DTI have designed for Son of David, it will present you with four levels that you need to take. So if you've got 100% black ownership, you will take on level one. Uh, if you are 51% black owned, you will take on level two. If you are less than 51% black owned, uh, you will take on level four. Now, the second category, which is your qualifying small enterprise. In this category, we've got two groups. We've got groups that are subjected to a verification process, and we've got groups that are treated the same as your exempted micro enterprises, meaning that they obtain your son affidavits. So the first group, so when you look at these qualifying small enterprises, they need to generate a total annual revenue of between 10 million and 50 million. So if you fall within the group where black ownership is less than 51%, you are then subjected to a verification process. In terms of the legislation, there's what we call the qualifying small enterprise scorecard, which its targets are different to those of a large enterprise they've got what we call relaxed compliance. They will need to then demonstrate compliance with the targets that are set for the five triple BE elements, which is ownership, 
management control, skills development, enterprise and supply development, as well as socioeconomic development. However, because the legislation identifies the challenges that black owned entities they face and the access and the challenges around access to capital and because verification processes they need to pay for, black owned qualifying small enterprise are also exempt from verification process and they are given automatic levels two and one if they've got 51% and 100% black ownership and they will also receive a Swan of a David. However, the templates for the Swan of a David that a qualifying small enterprise must comply with is different to that of an exempt and micro enterprise. Uh, with the qualifying small enterprise, you only have two levels, level one and level two. And there are certain additional requirements that you need to also indicate that an exempt and micro enterprise is not obligated to indicate. The last category will be your large enterprise, which is your uh, above 50 million total revenue on an annual basis, and they need to comply with the scorecard. In this category, you don't have uh, those with automatic levels. In this category, for an entity to determine a triple B status level, it means they would have been subjected to verification. Now, when we come to entities that will go into partnership, either in form of a joint venture, when they're going to a joint venture, each entity, if it's what we call an un incorporated joint venture, meaning that these are trading as two separate entities under normal circumstances, and they're coming together maybe for accessing the films and incentive, uh, the film and incentive uh, scheme. What they will do, they will need to go to a verification agency who will then consolidate their individual uh, triple B credentials in order to give them the credentials for that particular project that they are applying for the incentive scheme. And then also when you've got your incorporated joint ventures, those will be entities that are formally established and registered with the CIPC. And those entities then will determine their B measurement using uh, their own total annual revenue and determine whether they are an exempted micro enterprise, qualifying small enterprise or a large enterprise. Now, those entities that are usually subjected to verification these are the elements that they will need to comply with. Now, when you look at each and every all of the elements, uh, they would have most mainly or most of the time, they will have a target for black people. And they will also have other elements that will introduce a specific target for black women. So let's look at the ownership element, for example. The ownership element says 25% plus one vote needs to be in the hands of black people. So when you look at and we test for ownership, there are three critical uh, aspects that we test. We first test the aspect around accessible voting rights, whether black people have got accessible voting rights within that entity. We also look at whether black people have got economic interest. So economic interest by way of example would be a return on your ownership. Uh, for example, would be a, a dividend. So we'd look at if black people have got 25% plus one vote, are they enjoying 25% worth of dividends? And then lastly, we look at aspects around net value. So net value looks at the fact that in most instances, when black people go into these entities, they will normally have to take out a loan to acquire that shareholding. So when they take out a loan, that loan will either be provided by the entity in which they are acquiring shares, or they could go to any third party funder and acquire that loan. However, the legislation, because it wants black people to own and fully control that interest without uh, the, the obligations with regard to that financing. It says that when you have a loan, that loan must be repaid within a period of 10 years. But for each year, it will provide a target of that loan that must be paid off. So here, when you go to then the target, uh, we've said that it's 25% plus one vote that needs to be in the hands of black people and specifically 10% must be in the hands of women. And that is how the ownership element has included uh, black women owned targets. Now, when you go to the second element, which is management control, this element will measure five levels of management. It measures the board level. Under board, we look at black people with accessible voting rights. And we also look at black executives that sit at the board. And usually those will be your chief executive officer, your chief uh, financial officers. And then we also look at the other executives. Those who, that's the second level of management. 
The other executive would be executive who do not serve at board. It could be your human resource executive or your IT executive. And then we also look at your senior, middle, and junior management levels. So for each level of management, you will notice that the legislation provides for a target of black people that the entity must have as a representation of its management. And then half of that uh, at each and every level of management must be black women. So if we look at board, the board will say 50% of board representation must be black people and 25% must be black women. Meaning that from a B legislation, when you've got a black woman, you score twice uh, as an entity. You score for the fact that you have a black person and you score again when you have a black female. And again, that is how it progresses with regard to the different levels of management. And the third element is your skills development. With skills development, the issue here is making sure that we capacitate black people with critical and scarce skills or with the skills for the economy. And an entity will need to spend 6% of livable amount on an annual basis. So remember we indicated earlier on that you've got the qualifying small enterprise and the large enterprise. So the target for the livable amount for a large enterprise is 6% that they need to train for black people. And that includes black women. Then when you go to the scorecard for a qualifying small enterprise, that scorecard specifically has a target for women. And that is the 1% of livable amount that entities need to spend on an annual basis training black women and capacitating them so that the skills that they receive is skills that will allow them to participate in the economy. And then we've got the fourth element which carries much of the points on the scorecard. And that is the enterprise and supply development element. This element seeks to provide market access opportunities to triple B E compliant entities, as well as channel investments into black owned entities. So you've got the first part that looks at preferential procurement, how entities are procuring goods and services. And you will see that in this aspect, bulk of the procurement budget, which is 40%, must be directed with entities that are at least 51% black owned. And you've got 12% of the budget spent that must be spent with entities that are at least 30% women owned. And when we move to supply development and enterprise development, that is where entities have to spend a particular amount of their net profit after tax. So for supply development, they need on an annual basis to spend 2% of net, net profit after tax to capacitate black owned uh, exempted micro enterprises and qualifying small enterprises, either by providing financial support or by providing non-financial support. The support will be dictated by the needs of that particular entity. And then also under enterprise development, the entity will have to spend 1% of net profit after tax by supporting a black owned entities that are outside their supply chain. And then again there, they can either provide uh, financial support or non-financial support. So the beneficiaries of those supply development initiatives and enterprise development initiatives are black owned entities or black women entities and with 51% black ownership, that is the threshold. And the last element will be socioeconomic development, which encourage the inclusion of women from rural and underdeveloped areas. And it requires entities to spend 1% of their net profit after tax on an annual basis to provide and support initiatives that will enable black people in those areas to access the economy. So an entity, when they present their triple BE credentials, when they're applying for the film incentive, they'll either provide a son of a David uh, based on the automatic levels or based on the exempted market enterprise status, or they'll provide a triple B certificate, which that certificate would have been issued uh, determining compliance to these elements that are presented here. However, what we need to also note is that the fact that an entity trades with the son of a David, maybe it's an entity that is 51% black owned. It doesn't mean their ownership, when we need to test it, will test it against a different scorecard. We'll still test it against this ownership. So if we receive a referral from an incentive so indicating that uh, there may be concerns around the black ownership of a particular entity that has made an application for to access the incentive. We'll then look at that black ownership against these requirements, irrespective of whether that entity submitted a son of a David based on 
uh, automatic levels or they submitted a triple BE certificate. Now, some of the observation that we have noted with regard to concerns around women participation is that we've picked up that there's generally low levels of women participation across the board. And that is also supported by our statistics. For example, when we look at ownership, from the information that we have as a commission, uh, the ownership is for, has moved in 2019 was at 12%, and in 2020 it was sitting at 14.6%. However, this is the overall, but when you start to move and look at the ownership with regard to the different sectors, then you'll see that the levels are very low. But at the same time, when you look at the demographics of uh, South Africa in terms of race and gender, and you know that women normally count a majority of those, and the levels are still low. And then also where we found that sometimes you do have high levels of black women ownership, we find that the accessible voting rights do not correspond with the level of ownership. So you can have an instance, an entity that says we are 26% black women owned. But when you look at the accessible voting rights, they have 10% worth of accessible voting rights. So that could be done to restrict their participation. And we then cannot have empowerment of women if we do not have them exercising voting rights proportionate to their interest in an entity. And again, also on aspect of management control, we have found that the representation of women generally is very low. We have seen the target move uh, from 11, from 20% to 11% in 2020, based again on the information that is within our premises at the Triple B Commission. And then generally we've seen domination of uh, uh, white people and foreign nationals, as well as uh, black males. So around that area, we don't see a lot of entities that are controlled or managed by women. And in, in this case, black women. And again, when we look at uh, certain aspects, we've also noted that entities tend to split themselves into smaller enterprises so that they avoid the scrutiny that comes with the triple B verification process. So for example, you can have a large entity that generally they are re revenue at 50 million and above, but then because they don't want to be subjected to verification, they don't want to be proving a uh, compliance at the degree that the verification process requires, they start to say, to split themselves into smaller exempted micro enterprises and present a son of a David for each and every enterprises. But when you start to probe further within those entities, you start to see that these are just front entities, but the entity itself is a large enterprise and ought to be presenting a triple B certificate. And we also noted instances where women are also introduced in entities just to comply with either the triple B obligations that an organ of state or a public entity would have set with not necessarily having a real empowerment. And a case here that we may share is what we call the RICS technology integration case uh, that was brought by a lady within the Triple B Commission, who was, for example, a receptionist, was offered 30% in the entity, but she continued to be and performing her reception duties, but was not involved in the decision making and, uh, uh, of that entity. So she was not participating as a 30% shareholder would be. So those are the cases where we see that Black women are introduced just to tick the box. And another case that as the commission, we have successfully defended is a case uh, CRRCE local, uh, yeah. which involved a consortium, a female consortium, the Matetze Basadi consortium. They partnered together with that company for purposes of producing locomotives for Transnet. And after being awarded uh, that particular opportunity, they were then being sidelined not participating within, again, the decision structures of that entity. And again, particularly with regard to the films incentives, we see the use of invalid triple B certificates or son of a David. Now let's start with a son of a David. When you trade with a son of a David, one may think it's simple. However, it's important how one, uh, they depose to that son of a David, how they conclude or they fill in the information that is required. For example, the son of a David requires the deponent to be a director in the entity, or if it's a CC, to be a member, or a director if it's a PTY. 
So in many instances, you find that the deponent does not indicate what is their designation in the entity. And in certain instances, they don't even indicate uh, what information they use to say that, okay, my annual revenue was 10 million and less, or they don't even disclose properly the financial year end that they would have used to determine their status. So generally, then you'll find that that's one of the diverts because of its inconclusivity will be deemed invalid. Now, if you submit an invalid um, son of a David uh, as you are applying for an incentive, it means that you would not have fulfilled that part that talks to triple B compliance. And again, with invalid triple B certificate, you do find certificates that are presented that appear to have been issued by an accredited verification agency. But when you engage with that verification agency, they will advise that either they have not issued that particular certificate or they only issued a certificate in the previous year, then you could either mean that the entity would have tampered with the certificate in the present year to appear as if they've been issued with a valid certificate. Now, if you again have an invalid triple B certificate as you are applying for the film incentive, it means you will not necessarily satisfy the triple B status level that has been set. And also with the regard to the film incentive, we've found out that entities uh, after they've been issued with a certificate or they've deposed to a son of a David, they experience what we call a material change. A material change, for example, if you've got a group, uh, a group company, uh, they decide to trade with a consolidated certificate, meaning that the holding company and subsidiaries, they trade with one certificate and the certificate will have what we call Annex A, listing all the subsidiaries that are entitled to use that group certificate. In some instances, you find that the group will sell the company or will sell certain subsidiaries to another entity, meaning that we, we will qualify what we refer to in terms of triple BE as a material change. And then it means that you need to go for a re-verification and effect the results of that material change, whether positive or negative. So if you have sold a subsidiary that appears on Annex A, it means then as an entity, we need to go for a re-verification and then have a certificate that excludes that subsidiary. And that subsidiary entity, which normally are the entities that are used to apply for the film's incentive, will then have to determine their own BE measurement uh, in relation to the new ownership. Uh, and then when that does not happen, it means there is what we call misrepresentation of triple B status. In a sense that one can say, if the holding or the group company had a level four, you've submitted it for an incentive scheme, but meanwhile, you were sold as a, as a subsidiary and then you are not B compliant at that point in time because you have not submitted your new triple B credentials. So continue to trade with that group, level four group certificate is what we call a misrepresentation of triple B status. And also the concerns or some of the observation is fronting in general. So when you look at when we started operating, which is 2016 up until quarter one of this, 2021, 22 financial period, one will know that we have received 965 complaints and 83.3% of that, they relate to fronting, which is the majority of the cases that we have received with the commission. And then when you look only at quarter one of this financial year, we've received 58 complaints, which makes it 82.7% of the complaints that we have received and which relate to fronting. And 30% of that were lodged by women. And generally the cases that are lodged by women, they pertain to two elements of triple B, either ownership or management control. So meaning that even though on paper, it seems as if women, they own and manage part of an entity. When you probe further and when you look at the complaints that they have submitted to the commission, one would indicate that it's just a tick box compliance, but there's no real and actual empowerment. So this then brings us to the end of our presentation. So if you want to engage with the commission, seek advice uh, on any initiative that you are going into uh, before even submitting for your films and incentive uh, application to assist you with determining proper compliance with the triple B credentials. These are the contact details that you can use to be able to access the services that we advised on earlier. Thank you very much and back to you, Cindy. Uh, hi, Lindy. I just had to get our technical director to assist 
uh, the uh, camera had gone uh, on its own tangent. But thank you so much, uh, Lindy Wei Matonsela from the Triple BE Commission. And you touched on, I think, in your tail end of your presentation, the prevalence of fronting and how are you dealing with pri primarily industry that refuses to comply, and uh, and how. And, and how are these international franchises held or compelled to, to apply uh, uh, comply with Triple BE? Your, the likes of your uh, Big Brother, Survivor, what is it, The Bachelorette, and a whole host of others. Are they also compelled to comply with Triple BE? Yes, let me start with the first, last part of the, the question. So when you look at the triple B legislation, so if you've got a foreign based entity that is looking to produce a film or a program locally, and in doing that, they will either approach the DTIC or the NEF for funding. Based on them approaching the DTIC or the NEF for funding, they are then obligated to comply with the triple B requirements. And their compliance will then be determined in line with the general codes of good practice uh, if they can prove that they are an exempted micro enterprise, it means there will be a level four. But if they are a qualifying small enterprise or a large entity, they will then have to be subjected to verification and have a triple B certificate that they will submit together with their funding application. And then also, so their measurement will be determined the same way as a local uh, based entity. The, uh, the only difference uh, that we need to mention with foreign companies if an entity uh, says that we can't dilute ownership, for example, when you look at a level uh, three that is required, uh, for an entity to be a level three, they need to be scoring between 90 and 95 points in terms of triple BE. And then you find that some of them will not necessarily be able to score those points if they do not comply with the ownership element. Now you've got entities that will say, uh, we are foreign entities, we don't dilute our shareholding. Uh, they can then approve, approach the DTICs, particularly the B policy unit, to request to participate on what we call an H2 equivalent investment program, which then, if they are approved, they will receive ownership points uh, towards their BE status. However, they don't receive black ownership because they would say they don't necessarily have ownership, but they just receive points for purposes of having been approved for an H2 equivalent. And with regard to fronting, how we deal with it, as the commission, we've got an investigative mandate. So complaints can be lodged if one suspects fronting with an entity that has submitted for a film incentive. And even the unit itself within the DTIC can refer a matter for investigation if they pick up or they suspect a violation of the triple B legislation. Now there's a formal process that we follow when we're doing an investigation that is outlined in our regulation to say, will then receive that information. And we take it to what we call screening process to determine if the matter falls within our jurisdiction and it's a matter that we can investigate. If we determine that there is merit for us to probe the matter further, then we'll issue what we call notice of investigation against the company in whom the allegations or the case has been lodged against and we follow that process. But however, sometimes because of certain sensitivities that may concern those particular individuals, and they may not necessarily want to be known. And they can still bring that matter to our attention on an anonymous basis. And when a matter is on an anonymous basis, it's normally if it goes forward and is investigated, we refer to it as an initiative, meaning that it's a matter between the Triple B Commission and the entity in whom the complaint or the allegations are directed to us. So that is how we deal with aspects around uh, fronting. You are muted, Cindy. Your mic is muted, Cindy. Hi there. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Lindy. And I must apologize. Uh, colleagues on this part, for some reason, the computer just uh, logged off on its own. So I hope it's not too much of an inconvenience to those who are streaming as well. Lindy, well, thank you. Really, really appreciate it. So you're saying that the incentives are essentially used 
um, more as a stick, if you like, to compel industry uh, to comply to Triple BE and also to reinforce the importance of having this particular legislation in transforming uh, the economy. Yes, uh, especially when you look at the fact that with the Triple B legislation, the key driver would be your, your public sector, your organs of state and public entities. So in driving transformation, they will then use their different mandates uh, that they execute uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So in this in case, it will be your incentives to say, uh, be, be compliant in terms of how the legislation has said it. Because if on the side of, let's say the NEF, if they are not insisting on BE compliance, it means then they are violating section 10 of the triple B legislation. And in a way we will not necessarily be able to transform that sector if we it's business as usual. All right, Lindy, we're gonna leave it there. Thank you indeed for your time. And everybody else that's joining us, we will be simulcasting or we are simulcasting this production on social media and we'll upload it on their respective websites in uh, before close of business today. Uh, as we get Toby Lemajola uh, ready, she is uh, the investment analyst with Umnoto Fund at the National Empowerment Fund. So Toby, before you jump on, let me just go back to the questions and answer. Uh, and this one is relating to funding. And Nelly at the DTIC, a question from uh, one dilemma Molobaz says, thank you for the session, but why is the DTIC ignoring fundamental issues the sector is experiencing right now? As a female of color and youth, the DTIC has crippled me in the administration times of the claim, she says, and the communication is poor and it is near impossible to receive claims on time. Both the DTIC and the NEF have informed me the rebate is not reliable. How are we mitigating these serious issues as they are always ignored and how can we pioneer this rebate? I think, uh, Tobila, that may even be an introduction to your presentation if you you perhaps pick up from there, Tobile Majola. Good afternoon, oh, good morning. Good morning and, and welcome, Tobile. Your time starts now. Good morning, Cindy and the viewers. Uh, may I, okay, I was gonna request Cindy to stop sharing so that I can share my presentation. Lindy Way. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you so much, Cindy, and a good morning, um, everybody. For uh, thank you for joining us on this session. And before maybe I start, let me say uh, big ups to the organizers. What a way of closing the Women's Month. Um, I'm going to take you through the NEFs um, and Cindy, I will come back to that question um, as I unpack my presentation of the DTI, which was established under the National Empowerment Fund Act, number 105 of 1998. We are the driver and thought leader through promoting uh, and facilitating Black economic participation through provision of financial and non-financial support to Black-owned and managed businesses, as well as promoting a culture of saving and uh, investment among Black people. So our funding as the NEF starts from 250000 to $75 million. million. Um, the criteria that we use when we receive these applications uh, the assessment of impact is not driven only by financial returns, but measuring in terms of the empowerment dividend, uh, which is made up of the broad-based uh, Black economic empowerment. Uh, Lindy Wei has uh, said a mouthful regarding this one. Uh, we, looked at the, we look at the ownership, the management uh, control and the employment equity. So you need to be the owner of the business and you need to be uh, um, you need to be present in the business. We need you to participate. And we also look at the Black women empowerment. So, um, which is, I think, why we are here. We look at the, the Black women, the ownership of the Black women. We, are, we, we, we would like to see more and more of Black women 
out there coming in uh, and owning these businesses and not just also we look at the job creation how much of that you're contributing to the economy uh, the growth sectors uh, where is the business going to go in future geographic spread we not just focus on Gauteng or your big cities but we like to see ourselves more in your small cities like your Northern Cape, your Kurman of this world, your Uppington, uh, Eastern Cape, deep down rural, we'd like to see ourselves there. And then uh, most importantly is the investment return. Uh, for each and every investment uh, we make, we'd like to see the return uh, uh, made back to the NEF. And then um, the background of this fund or of why maybe we're here today. I'll take you through when we had the um, Department of Arts and Culture. We had a partnership with them on the tender. Uh, we were then asked to manage the funds for the period of three years. The partnership uh, allocated some funds to the NEF, which then began in the financial year 2016 and 2017. We allocated 20 million during that year, 30 million in 2017 and 2018 and then 50 million in 2018 and 2019. You will notice that um, the last allocation was in 2019, which means that this partnership has then uh, ended. The reason I'm touching on this, it's because prior this, um, this partnership, NEF was not uh, that visible, we have films that we funded, but uh, after this, we then saw ourselves more participating more on funding on, on the films, and also um, we saw the numbers increasing on our side. So this was provided through the Venture Capital Fund. Uh, it was designed to support the entrepreneurs wishing to start or expand uh, their existing businesses. Uh, the fund sought to address past imbalances by addressing Financing instrument uh, for the creative industries contributing. Hi, I, uh, Tobila, we've just lost you there. So while you are reconnecting, may I just please request Nelly from the DTIC to address some of the questions I mentioned earlier on. And hopefully Tobila would be able to locate herself on higher ground where there is better reception. So uh, also a reminder is that the presentations and webinar, uh, will be or the recording will be shared with all participants. We'll put it on the respective websites, and there'll also be a follow-up session, a sequel to this particular series, where we'll look at access to markets and non-financial services and support that will be coming up in the month of September. So, if you you just joined us, we were looking at compliance mainly for full make. Uh, intellectual property, protecting your own um, product and ideas. And there was a question from one dilemma, uh, Nelly, if you're on that the DTIC is ignoring issues around, um, especially when it comes to administration times in processing claims and the rebate, the issue around the rebate um, is not reliable. Can you maybe just touch on that quickly? Thank you so much, uh, Cindy. Uh, um, uh, in most cases, what we have seen is um, uh, companies um, uh, do not comply to what was approved uh, and do not comply again to the guideline and also to uh, BE. So the main issue in terms of delaying the processing of uh, claims is compliance. 
So that is why uh, I was glad that um, and Lindy Wei was reinforcing compliance uh, at all the time uh, together with uh, Mujalefa. So uh, 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 applicants need to ensure that compliance is uh, maintained from approval of application until to the claim. Thank you. All right, just the, uh, in terms of the rebate, does that also pertain to compliance? Because one dealer seems to uh, be frustrated with the administration process generally and communication not being adequate. Um, uh, in terms of in terms of communication, we do communicate to all the applicants uh, on the matters, um, and also we ensure that uh, if people do not comply, we indicate. And if your your claim has been repudiated, appli applicants have got thirty days to submit their appeal, so that it can go to a second level. Uh, that will look at your uh, at the case that you have stated or the motivation that you have provided, and if uh, uh, that committee uh, sees that the mot motivation um, is good enough, uh, they can approve it or they can reject and still give you um, a, a rejection. All right, I've also sent you another question that came through via email on Nemesis production. So hopefully before we wrap up the proceedings today, you'd be able to, we'd be able to give feedback uh, okay. to the okay. prospective client. Tobile, uh, let's go back to you. I do apologize that we had to take a question quickly because your, your um, connectivity was intermittent. But uh, as you were, Tobile. Thank you, thank you, Cindy. Apologies for that. Um, I do have the power failure around my area, so that's why um, we keep on getting disturbed. So, um, so continuing, um, the sectors that we looked at when we were servicing um, that uh, agreement with the DTIC was the film and television production, radio production, publishing, craft, music and performing arts, fashion design, radio, uh, painting, uh, arts and galleries. Although uh, I should highlight that most of the application came from film and television production. So these uh, applications were funded under the instrument of venture capital loan, uh, which was used for our startup, um, set up or if maybe the language that the filmmakers would understand will be the equity um, and we also had the revolving credits uh, for existing businesses working capital and the bridging finance uh, where we would cash flow the DTIC uh, milestones uh, or your Netflix whoever the, the, the funder that will need cash flowing and then we also had uh, the installment sale agreement, which was used uh, for assets acquisition for those that wanted to buy the cameras and so on. So, um, yeah. So on this partnership, the highlights that were there uh, as the different non-financial supports intervention during the packaging of transaction were provided for most clients like the hand holding so the applications that would receive will not be ready for the nef so we'll then hand hold the applicant uh, try and assist them into packaging the application in order for it to be ready to be assessed by the nef we also provided the training we also provided the training um and capacity building session to improve the understanding on the film industry, uh, the funding model and requirements that were held. Uh, the simulated entrepreneur, entrepreneurship training provided to emerging business to ensure the sustainability. Uh, we also had the mentorship at the back office supports that is provided by our, our post investment units. Um, the constant visits and monitoring of the businesses and see how they're performing post our funding. 
uh, some clients got the exposure through marketing channels like um, National Tourism in Daba. Some were nominated to showcase their films at the Cane. They came back to us. They asked us to assist them in um, raising the funds to market uh, their films. And also the incubation and online business planner tool where the supports that were provided. And I should highlight that this support was not just for that, um, that funding, but it is what NEF does on a day-to-day -day basis. So if you do come to the NEF, this is the support that you're going to get. We also had the challenges when we looked at the, at the, at the applications and these were the eye openers on our side. Because as I said that, when we started with this uh, uh, partnership, we had not seen a lot of movies, but when we started, we then started to see the application and we learned the, the challenges that are there outside the film um, and television production sector. So the fund, had a, a, we had a greater, like I said, the greater traction in the film and television sector um, than in other subsectors. The majority clients in the sector require a greater non-financial support and hand-holding prior to funding being provided. So um, I have explained the hand-holding that the applications were not ready, we would support them. And also looking at the, um, Looking at the application, we would notice that um, the business really cannot really afford the repayments of the loan, like uh, Cisneli has said that NEF will provide the loans, would not um, afford the loan, the repayments of the loan, and we look and we see that no, this really needs a grant than a loan. So the sector is averse to debt funding and prefers grants instead. Those um, that are milestone based will Require milestones to be achieved prior uh, to the drawdowns. So this is where we come in. And I must say and emphasize that this is currently, this is the NAF sweet spot uh, when it comes to funding of the film and, um, and television productions, where we would cash flow <clears throat> the likes of the DTIC, mostly would receive the application that would fund cash flowing on the last milestone of the DTIC because it comes way after and the producers, they need money um, now for the production. So then they would approach us and um, make an application. Then we provide that cash flowing. So um, that's also a need uh, to explore alternative funding structures to address the high risk nature of the business in the sector. So, um, when the applicants approach us, we also uh, would like them to have uh, have the film funded, fully funded. So we've seen the likes of your ECDC, they are now coming in into assisting. We do have your NFVFs, we do have your KZN. So if the filmmakers can approach those, those sectors, uh, the North sectors, these um, funders, prior coming to us in order to um, take down the risk. We, 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 yeah, we would appreciate that a lot. So, and also the COVID-19 pandemic has affected um, the sector a lot. Um, uh, there was a period where they could do nothing and uh, they had their approvals on hand. Some, they even went, they, they even expired because they could not uh, start the shooting and everything. So yeah, it has affected us. So the lessons that we have learned uh, as the NEF while um, unpacking these applications is the difficulties in establishing the commercial viability of film and television productions. Um, normally we would receive uh, the, 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 the projections from the distributors so they have the high, they have the medium, then, then they have the low. Mostly would use the medium um, just in case, uh, uh, it would use the medium because for each and every businessman, if I may say, uh, the, 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 the main purpose of them establishing their business is to make profits. So in order for us to be conservative, that then we take the, the, the medium case. On this medium case, um, we, we, we would still see that um, 
sometimes when we go to the end to the profit sharing then that's the, the the filmmakers will end up not making anything out of this uh, all the monies that will come will then go towards the repayments of these loans that are made so um then it kills the the commercial viability of 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 the business uh, and the affordability of of the loans uh, the lack of the financial know-how by the applicants uh, applicants some applicants when you request the projections give me the the projections for the movie they they do not know what you're talking about and then, which is why it's important before they come to us as the NEF, they should have these relationships with your distributors who will then assist them in, um, in, in, in unpacking and having these uh, projections done for them. Uh, we've also learned that the lead actor must be the known person. If your film has uh, Angelina Jolie, then it will sell in South Africa and abroad. But if you bring in a Tobile Majola, everybody will be like, who is Tobile Majola? We don't know this person. So we've also learned that as well. Uh, and also our own films do not uh, enjoy large scale of support from our own local audiences. So this is with us as the audience to change our mindset and support our, our proudly South African uh, films. And also it's up to the producers as well to show us that um, they, yeah, they, 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 these films are worth of our local audience's time. They can really look at them and enjoy them. Uh, we've also um, noticed that the script needs to be vetted by a, an independent person who will assist the team or the production team uh, and get them ready for the production. Um, the reasonability of the projected gross profit uh, across box office. So this is what I was talking about earlier when I was saying we, we would normally receive uh, three cases where there is a high, a medium and the, and the low. So if the distributors now can then be reasonable when they're making these numbers, when they're doing these numbers, not to overpromise, um, not to overpromise, but to be reasonable. We would also um, request that you benchmark this with your similar movies and the similar genres that um, you 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 that were there or that the product the distributor has distributed and we look at that performance and then we match it or we benchmark it to the one that is projected. Marketing and advertising, uh, this is very important. This is very important. Uh, it, it, it helps the film. By the time the film, the, the, the movie is opening, everybody knows about it and everybody is queuing. Uh, to watch that movie, I would make an example of your 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 your, your American produced movies. By the time they're opening in South Africa, you find the queues at the cinemas. You find the cinemas are fully booked. Uh, if we can also beef up on the marketing and advertising on our side, uh, by the time the movie opens, we are also ready as the South Africans. So um, the cash flow challenges uh, created payments delayed from the milestone based funders. Um, this I have touched on. Um, so the following is the list of the documents that we would need from the applicants. So you need to complete our NEF application form. It is available on our website. Uh, also, if you call on to the National Empowerment Fund, we do have product advisors that can forward you the application form. Um, the script needs to be uh, vetted, needs to be independently reviewed before submitting to us. Um, the production budget as well, um, what, what I call the, the projections, we also need that. The finance plan as to who are the investors in the businesses, uh, who, who is there in, as, as the equity funders, the grant funders, the, um, all of those, we need them. And then um, 
the production schedule. You need to give us the, the production schedule, what's starting and when you're starting with all of this. Uh, the cash flow schedule, that one is um, mostly on your on when we're cash flowing and um, your DTIC would have given you this one. Um, the revenue estimates that are, prepare, are prepared by the, by the distributors, whether international or local. Normally, uh, filmmakers will have two distributors, your local distributor and your international distributor. So all of these will have to give us these numbers um, that they are projecting for the movie. And the release schedule, when is the movie, um, uh, when is uh, the movie planned for the release, um, the recruitment waterfall. Who comes in first uh, from this fund? The distribution agreement uh, or letter of intent with your distributors needs to be in place. Completion guarantee or letter of intent also needs to be in place. And then um, collection agency, if there is karma involved, we would need a letter of intent or an agreement. And then um, the talent attached, the crew and the cast, the crew and the cast. So um, like I said, that currently NAF Sweet Sports is the cash flowing of the milestone, be it the DTI, be it your Netflix, your Mnet, wherever that needs to be cash flowed, that's where we would um, participate currently as we are still assessing the portfolio of the previously funded movies. So when you um, do this, uh, we would dwell on the talent, we dwell on your cast, we'll dwell on your suppliers, cause these are the things that Nelly was um, uh, are talking about that, most of the of, of, of the filmmakers would not get the last milestone because they do not comply. So we would like to be um, sure that you have complied with this. Uh, if you do have a checklist from the DTIC that you can submit that this is the tech checklist and this is what I have done in order to make sure that I comply with the fifth uh, last milestones requirement for the DTIC. With all of that, uh, thank you, Cindy, for the opportunity. Over to you. Chobila, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and we understand the inconvenience of not having power where you are in your area, but uh, we appreciate that you took the time to come engage with us. I just quickly want to touch on a few points. I'm not sure if uh, you deliberately didn't mention some of the um, the shining examples that we have in this space. I think the recent series is Upetina Way 2, which is co-funded by the NEF, and that's on SABC, uh, SABC 1. There is Mr. Bones 3 is coming up, I think, uh, by the end of the year, if all goes well. There our Zulu wedding, um, Knuckle City, uh, so the, the winter under my skin, and that's, you know, with, uh, various other projects that were co-funded by the NAF. I wanna come back to what you were saying that the industry is uh, debt loan averse and prefers grants and, and how creatives and filmmakers would get assistance. If, if the NAF were a one-stop shop and they come and they don't have a, a vetted script or even budgets, what kind of assistance the, the, the hand holding that, that you were referring to does the NAF offer? Okay, thank you Sita, for the question. So um, we would, um, we, so when the advert comes out, people get excited and they will then put in this application, not knowing that they still have to go and approach your likes of the DTIC, they'll still have to approach the, the, your, your hollet or whoever the, the completion bonder will be. Um, and they would not know. Some they will come, they have approached those people but then they are not getting any responses or they actually do not understand the language. As you said, it, there, there might be that, that they do not understand that language that the completion bonder is saying. So we would call on your holland, there's your Paul, there's your Moroba who used to work there. We'll call on, call the client, let's have the meeting in all one room, explain to the client in the language that the client will understand and then let's get these documents done. 
some uh, would come back and say DTIC, um, they've said, uh, I do not comply, but I don't know how because I'm black and then would we'll make a phone call. Uh, DTIC, can we have a meeting? Uh, this is the client that we, 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 we have and these are the challenges that the client has. And the DTIC would explain, no, they're not declined, but they just need to correct the information. So that's the kind of handholding because maybe sometimes it is the language that they do not understand. And when we come in and then we say, uh, explain to us, maybe we'll be able to explain to the client in a way that the client will understand. Uh, that's how we've dealt with that. All right, and, and uh, the NEF in terms of product and services uh, does fund startups up to acquisition depending on the lifespan of your business. So if you're a production company, Tobile, and you, you are essentially starting out, but you've got vast experience in the industry, you do not necessarily have the equipment, the infrastructure, uh, all you have is a concept that you want to develop a, a production company, a fully fledged production company, what kind of funding is, is available for such and what are the requirements? Okay, so for 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 that, um, we provide loan. So as anyone who would provide a loan would um, want to get that comfort that the money that they've provided to you uh, is going to come back. So um, when we look at those applications, say for, for the equipment, um, maybe the client has gotten a job with the SAPC, I'll make an example, with the SAPC, uh, they have to produce, or maybe with the production company that works with the SAPC, but there is actually the work that they're going to do with that equipment, because it's not going to help them to get them the equipment and give them the loan, but they cannot uh, use that equipment in order to make uh, money to pay, the, the, to pay back the loan. So that person would need to have received that, kind, that, that work that um, they're going to use the equipment for. So for the requirements, they still need to fill in our application form. They still to give us the business plan and um, highlight for us uh, what's the use of funds, how, what uh, the funds are gonna be used for. And um, uh, we also need their company to be registered, a registered company. Um, and an agreement that they have with the, the, their client, if they're going to be providing a service to your SABC, will need to have a side of that agreement. Um, yeah, basically it, it will be the, 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 those and the financial projections, not to leave them out, the financial projections so that we can see if it is a commercial viable um, business case or not. A question from uh, Katharina Weinick says, NEF, you don't cash flow all the milestones your presentation suggests you do. Do we cash flow all the milestones, Tobile? Yes, Cindy, provided they are approved by the DTIC, we can cash flow all the milestones. And Katrina, I hope that answers your question. Uh, and we will upload the webinar. I, I realize that there's a bit of confusion as to um, the availability of all this information, but we will upload the webinar on the respective websites. Uh, Deirdre Rosenberg, yes, uh, we will give you feedback. And uh, Deirdre wants to know, will feedback be pro provided and applicants assisted or will uh, projects be rejected if some things need to be improved? Tobila, do we, how do we, how do we interface with, with clients especially when it comes to pre-investment and uh, maybe not all documents have been submitted or there's something missing. What is the response generally? Uh, is it just immediate rejection or is there some, some uh, form of assistance going forward? No, Sidi, we don't immediately reject. Um, pre-investment will capture the application and allocate it to Umnoto. When it comes to Umnoto, Tobile will open the application or any other investment associate within Umnoto We'll open the application and we'll notice some of the uh, of the documents are missing, and then an email will be sent to the client. Um, we've received your application. However, these are the requirements, and uh, we've noticed that we do not have all of these. So kindly submit uh, some of 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 these uh, missing documents, and then we give the client some time to collate all that information. 
and then sent back to us. But if maybe in a, in a quest of um, keeping an, an, an active uh, pipeline, if those documents take time to come back to us, we then come back to the client and say, we have not received these documents. And um, in uh, maybe we'll give you two weeks more. If that not received, then we will then redraw your application. All right, and, and one, I think that where the any effort might not even be related, but it's uh, probably more for the DTIC around the rebates. Uh, Anonymous says this rebate scheme has failed the sector. Why is the DTIC not engaging the sector? Um, he or she says, I have 23 million outstanding. What is being done to solve this? So Nelly, if you're still with us, please won't you respond to that? Uh, similarly to what one dealer was saying earlier, with regards to the rebates, it seems to be a sticky uh, a thorn on the side of film makers. Nelly? Okay. And by the way, you. thank you. Thank you, Tobili. Yes, over to you, Nelly. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Cindy. Um, I think uh, the DTI is not avoiding the thorny issues that are available, but um, uh, uh, main issues are in terms of compliance. As, in, as indicated that uh, applicants need to comply to all the regulations and, and the guidelines that, that they were approved uh, uh, from. Um, I think compliance is the main, is the main issue. Um, but I think from the anonymous uh, who have sent uh, that thing, uh, if, if uh, the person is available to send us an an email and then we can engage offsite. And uh, uh, another one was on the nemesis of a rapist. Yeah? I think you said uh, um, the applicant also uh, uh, was rejected uh, in terms of compliance, uh, was rejected from um, the applicant was, application was not sent to the adjudication, but was uh, rejected during the screening of the application. And also we can engage with uh, him or her uh, offsite on the application. All right, Nelly, thank you so much for that. And if there are no other questions, I'll just ask our panelists to please give your closing remarks. And I think a sense of uh, urgency that as creatives, what you want to do is to see your product on the screens and it's not even about the premiere or the red carpet necessarily, but it's just getting your idea, giving it legs and life, because it's a story that is so compelling and riveting. All you want to do is to tell the story, but you have to get bogged down in the administrative and red tape of how funding, uh, Development Funding Institute generally operate because of policies and by law. This is generally how you, know, you can work around it. So just um, if we can go back to you, Mujabilu, uh, just in terms of wrapping up and giving guidance to what creatives need to do, uh, maybe even a survival uh, strategy or how to start and, and make sure that you sustain your, your business, the compliance, the importance thereof, and the assistance from CIPC. Mujapilo? Uh, if Mojapilo is still getting ready, uh, Lindy, well, you can also just wrap it up for us. Contact details, your presentation, and uh, the what, what we need to look out for. Sometimes it's even a blind spot. When you put together a deal or a partnership that you may find yourself being in tr transgression of the law and compliance issues. So just in wrapping up your two minutes, two minutes start now. No, thank you, Cindy. I think from our side, what we can encourage everyone is to access the services that we offer. We understand that some of the agreements can be too technical. So the services that we offer will assist them to obtain advice so that when they go into and eventually sign on that partnership, they understand what are the imperatives from a triple B legislation. And as we've indicated, you can email us, you can call us. Uh, I think we've indicated a slide on our presentation, but what is of importance is that when we go into B initiatives, it's important that we do so with the aim of empowerment. If we only do so for the aim of just ticking the box and compliance, we are equally guilty of perpetuating fronting and eventually we will not see the sector transform, even if there are incentives meant to ensure that there is transformation. Thank you very much and back to you, Cindy. 
Natasha Lindiwe. I've got another uh, question here or comment from Leila Swart, the producer who has produced two of the films mentioned. So the winter and Knuckle City. I want to resolve this as I'm unable to pay back the NEF due to the long delays of processing the final claim. Compliance can be rectified. I need help to understand where the compliance issues are. And it has been over two years. We need support to comply. Tobile, this one is for you. Thanks, Leila. Thank you, Cindy. Um, yeah, um, I think, Cindy, it's more of the DTI because what the, 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 the funding that we provided for Leila was the, to cash flow the, the, the DTI. Um, so she has mentioned that she has not received a, a last milestone from the DTI and she's convinced that she does comply with, the, with all the requirements. So maybe the DTI can then highlight where, 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 where is this, um, the, the bottleneck is in, 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 in paying out the last milestone for Knuckle City or for the Soul Winter and Tomaski. Okay, uh, and Nelly, I'm not sure if you'd be able to, okay. to answer specifically to Leila, but if not, we can also offline it. But if you're able to give feedback, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, in terms of the Sue, the winter to my skin, uh, it's in regards to non-compliance to the guideline because uh, the producer has used um, a non-black uh, a, a, a producer, which was recommended by, uh, if I'm not sure, by the IDC. Uh, and the applicant has submitted an appeal um, uh, uh, that will go to the appeals committee uh, uh, for approval or rejection, uh, we'll hear from the appeals committee. In terms of the in, uh, of the knuckle city, uh, knuckle city, uh, I'm not sure uh, because I'm not uh, I'm not dealing with uh, uh, claims, film claims, um, and I know uh, she has escalated uh, the matter to the manager responsible for claims. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you very much, Nelly. If there's anything else, I think just to assist uh, applicants, investees, or beneficiaries in the processes. Um, I know that in the NEF, there are investment committees for different sectors, different funding as well. And, and I wasn't privy to this information before I joined the organization, that it is about, um, you know, uh, crossing the T's, dotting the I's, ticking the boxes, meticulously so, and you can't get away from that. So there, there, there's a committee of people that sit down and, and, and verify your application before it's then moved to, to the next phase up until disbursement. So compliance is a, a, a policy, it's a regulatory um, imperative that, that you know, creators also need, need to be aware of. So we're gonna leave it there, but Nelly, there's a question just in terms of contact details. I know that we say send an email, but if it just goes to the generic email, it may even take longer for people to be assisted. So if you don't mind uh, sharing your email address or the contact slides, and I will also post my email address for any further questions from now. But thanks everybody for joining us. As we mentioned this is the first part of a series of events that we'll do primarily in the film and television space. So Ikamalama Kosigazi Malibongwe as we wrap up Women's Month. Thank you so much for your time and uh, be abundantly blessed. Cheers for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.